Welcome to the Humanities Team Podcast with me, Steve Farrell. Humanities Team is an international spiritual movement whose purpose is to communicate and demonstrate the timeless truth that we are all one, with the divine and all life, caring for each other and the world we share, so that people's actions reflect this profound understanding within our generation. We believe that living this truth is essential to resolving the most chronic and acute world challenges and vital to creating a flourishing world of peace, harmony, and happiness. We offer transformative education programs in personal and spiritual development, and we host an annual event called Global Oneness Day. Similar to Earth Day, which galvanized the global environmental movement, Global Oneness Day has become a catalyst for spiritual activism and an integral part of the present-day global oneness movement which represents a profound new paradigm in human culture. Humanities Team is the only global nonprofit organization working in transformational education. Since we are a nonprofit, there is no focus on growing profits or satisfying shareholders, and 100% of all revenue goes toward our work supporting conscious evolution, planetary awakening, and flourishing at every level of life. If you'd like to learn more about us or want to support our mission directly through donation or volunteering some of your time, please visit us online at humanitiesteam.org. And lastly, if you enjoy this podcast, we'd be grateful if you'd leave us a review. Um, let's go ahead and get started. I want to just say uh, good morning to everybody and good afternoon to people in other time zones and welcome to our Oneness in 12 Spheres of Life call. This month we're focusing on health. And also a big welcome to all of you who are part of the Living in Oneness Summit. We've combined both the programs for this call. So thank you for being with us and welcome to each of you. I'm Steve Farrell, the Worldwide Coordinating Director for Humanities Team and I want to invite you to get comfortable. The next hour is going to be truly a delight. I'm here with my co-host, Barbara Fields, with the Association for Global New Thought, Barbara Marks Hubbard with the Foundation for Conscious Evolution, Anna Marie Petiers with Humanities Team. You'll hear from them shortly. I'm also here with our special guest, Dr. Deborah Rosman with HeartMath. We'll introduce her shortly. I invite you to go to the livingin1.com site, and then down at the bottom, click on Program and Replay, uh, and then you can, over on the right margin, you'll see May 8, Deborah Rosman. Go ahead and uh, go to that event page, May 8, Deborah Rosman, and you can share your name, city, country, comments, questions, inspirations there on the page. We're making time during the hour to bring a few items in. Thank you. And uh, Barbara Fields, are you back? Yes, I am. Hello, everybody. I understand that we have a, a big crowd with us today, and I just couldn't be more thrilled with this is the, the fifth, I think Steve's already mentioned, in, in our particular series called Oneness in the Twelve Spheres of Life, and we're just so glad that it overlapped with the summit today because that's just a perfect fit. It is, and uh, so much fun. We're going to just do some quick self-introductions by our host team, starting with Anna Marie Petiers. Wonderful. Thank you. Good day, everyone. It is my great pleasure to be in conversation with you all today, exploring how oneness is at play in the sphere of health. I'm also delighted to be in communion, as always, with my colleagues, and especially excited to meet and to share time and space with you, Deborah Rosman. I have been involved with Humanities Team since, since 2005 as the country coordinator for South Africa, and I've had the privilege to serve on a worldwide level in different ways. I'm currently blessed to co-lead the Humanities Team Oneness in 12 Spheres of Life initiative together with the Worldwide Coordinating Director for Humanities Team and the host of this series, Steve Farrell. I'm especially passionate about this sphere that for me ultimately deals with the question of reality. I'm so much looking forward to a great discussion and I would like to wish everyone a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Marie, and it's Barbara Marks Hubbard here. Okay, I think she. I just spoke with her a minute ago, and she's got the numbers, and she'll be with us as soon as she can. Fantastic. And Barbara, do you want to uh, go next with this self-introduction? No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 
I thought we need a little lighthearted relief here. Um, I'm Dr. Barbara Fields. I'm Executive Director of the Association for Global New Thought. Um, and we were delighted to partner with Humanities Team for uh, um, Global Wonders Day last year, and are looking forward to doing that again this year. Um, AG&T, as some of you may know, is responsible for the Gandhi King Seasons for Peace and Nonviolence campaigns. We're now in the midst of Season for the Earth, and we have people signed up from all over the world, and I know that many of you on the call are, are participating in Season for the Earth with us. And we're most excited right now because all of these topics, spirit, society, the self, everything that we've been discussing about oneness is the topic of a brand new film festival that AG&T is sponsoring in Santa Barbara, California this October. And if anybody wants to learn a little bit more about that, because it's a real face-to-face -face gathering, you can, you can find out more at awakenedworldfilmfestival.com. Okay, perfect, and that's going to be quite an event out there in Santa Barbara, and it's just after Global Wellness Day this year. Um, I had a chance to introduce myself earlier. I'm Steve Farrell with Humanities Team, and I'd like to share briefly about the Living in Oneness Summit that this call is part of and then share the agenda for this call. The Living in Oneness Summit was created to provide tools for really living in the world as one. Many, including noted, noted scientists, share everything is connected, everything is a part of one presence, and this is ultimate reality. But as we know, there is precious little discussion about how to live in the world as one, as part of the divine. This is what this summit is about. We've brought over 30 leaders together, including the leaders on this call, to share their practice for living as one. We are broadcasting live each day with at least two programs, and we're talking about how we can come fully alive as part of the divine. On this call, we're going to focus on living as one in our own life and discuss health care, especially the data HeartMath has collected, analyzing our current health and stress levels and programs they recommend for creating optimal joy, health, and well-being. This is going to be an informative and very valuable discussion. Uh, I've so been looking forward to it, uh, as you might have heard as we were chatting before this call. Here's the agenda for our hour together. Barbara Marks Hubbard is going to go next, and we'll introduce and then do the evocation for the wheel of co-creation. This is the basis for what humanity's team calls oneness in the 12 spheres of life. Then Anna Marie Pateris is going to overview the sphere we are focusing on this month, health. Barbara Marks Hubbard is then going to introduce and interview Dr. Deborah Rosman with HeartMath. Barbara Fields will then moderate an interactive panel discussion with Deborah and each of the hosts on this call. Then we'll bring in some comments and questions from you, our listeners, and at the end we'll share next month's program and close. And I just want to say we also need to have a hard stop of uh, the hour. So right at 11 Pacific time we do have a hard stop because uh, this is the, uh, the Living in Oneness Summit. So Barbara Marks Hubbard, if you're here, over to you. I I just connected with her and she had different numbers than the ones that were used. Okay, today, here I am. Here she okay. Is. okay. I don't know well, why. Look they were at that. Different. Perfect. Just right on time, Barbara. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> the, uh, this is uh, you, the three minute uh, overview of the, the evocation for the wheel of co creation. Just that uh, three minute overview. We're, we're doing that right this second? Yeah, yeah. And then, then we'll, do the, uh, we'll do the introduction and the uh, interview with uh, Deborah. If that's okay, and oh, I think Anna sure. so, is actually going to talk about health after you do the three minutes. So we have uh, welcome, an overview, and then self introductions. Those come first and second, then the wheel, right? Yes, yeah, right. We've, we've already done that. those. We're in process. Oh, right, right at the evocation of the wheel part. Oh, oh, perfect. I'm. Just... <laughs> okay, so I'll do that now. Yes, please. Perfect. Uh, the wheel of co-creation is a social sim of oneness. It is a social process to create wholeness, cooperation, and co-creativity. The 12 spheres of life each represent an organic function in any community at any size or scale, from small to large. And by bringing it together visually, spiritually, and socially, I believe we can contribute to the oneness of humanity. Thank you. 
Gee, thank you, Barbara. And I think Anna Marie goes next with the overview of the sphere of health. Okay. Yes, yeah, sure thing. Thank you. So basically, this sphere deals with the vitality, well-being, and wholeness of living systems. Looking at the whole question of health, wellness, vitality, and healing through the lens of oneness, we do so from the premise that we are not our bodies, that we are spirits having a human experience. We notice that in some mysterious way, everything is connected to everything else. So therefore, illness is somehow deeply embedded in networks, systems, and change, chains of pathology. We are living in times during which we as humans are more and more able to see what is happening inside of our bodies is directly affected by our environment. We no longer perceive ourselves as separate beings, but instead as complex, adaptive systems within systems. Our concepts of health have evolved with our awareness, and we know that our thoughts and emotions have an impact on our health. One of in Health promotes a model of healing in which personal relationships, emotions, meaning, and belief systems are viewed as fundamental points of connection between body, mind, spirit, society, and nature. One of medicine embraces the recognition that human beings possess emotional, spiritual, and relational dimensions that are essential in the diagnosis and treatment of disease and the cultivation of wellness. Traditionally, we are used to seeing the, the scientist as standing separate from that which he or she observes. Today, however, it is scientifically concerned that the two are never separate. With this being so, we can now ask the fundamental questions, who is the healer and who is being healed? We are not now able to consider what the statement, all healing is self-healing means, and what the 2,000-year-old Hippocratic Oath do no harm to your patients really means. Those who have developed the oath would have realized that all of the power that a physician has, much of which is undoubtedly beneficial, beneficial and positive, there is also the unprecedented capacity to harm a person legally. It was also understood that there were two ways to do harm, sins of commission and sins of omission. A physician can harm a patient with what he or she knows, but even more so with what he or she does not know. Although one of in health recognizes and includes the pioneering holistic, allopathic, alternative and complementary approaches, one of in health medicine is much wider in its reach and more grounded in empirical research and more effectively related to comprehensive models of human psychology and consciousness. It includes the enduring and effective elements of complementary as well as conventional medicine, whilst launching something completely new. A one approach to health and healing is considerate of the person, the disease, as well as the physician. Instead of establishing which mythology is right and which is wrong, it rather asks, what kind of a world is it that allows all of these methodologies to arise and be necessary in the first place? This sphere, therefore, is perhaps one of the most dynamically shifting areas of human understanding. As our awareness of whole systems expands, we begin to see and experience the interconnectedness of everything to the extent that boundaries are beginning to disappear and taking us to unimaginable heights when it comes to our health care. The stage is set for the extraordinary miracle that we will begin to understand that which most of us yet maybe do not understand which is healing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna Marie. Uh, that was uh, very profound and insightful. And uh, so thank you very much. And next up is uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard with uh, introducing our guest and then bringing uh, questions to our special guest today. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I am so delighted to introduce Deborah Rosman. I believe I've known Deborah probably longer than most, uh -huh. even even before HeartMath. Isn't that right, Deborah? Oh, yes, many years. That's right. We were forming core groups and love at the core and working together uh, before before HeartMath formed. And I then became, of course, familiar with her work at HeartMath. And it's been an amazing journey from this very small beginnings to have developed 
a, a process based on basically learning how to use love to heal, to, to cure, to change reality in the simplest possible way. And through the inspiration of Doc Lou Childress and the whole huge organization of HeartMath that has been developed, they are now reaching into the military, into hospitals, into schools, places where certain kinds of more spiritual or evolutionary thought may not be welcome. HeartMath is there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it care and with Deborah at its leadership with her partner Martin uh, uh, the, the two of them, I feel, are making among the greatest contribution that any group is making to the more peaceful and creative evolution of humanity. I'm so happy to introduce you, Deborah. Well, thank you, Barbara. I'm so happy to be here with the uh, Living in One and the Humanities team, and especially you, our long Connection and heart connection and friendship is uh, is meant a lot to me. Yes. Thank you. So I think, uh, Deborah, that um, it's time for you to be uh, questioned. Yes. 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 Okay. So this would be calling on questions for Deborah. Oh, am I to ask the questions for yes. Deborah? You got <laughs> Barbara, do you do you have the um the do you have I the have paper that that we we sent with questions on it? No. Because I can certainly if you want to just um chat with Deborah for a minute, I I can print it out and bring it over to you. Yes. I can okay. just jump right in here. I'll open up the question. Okay, let me uh, let me go ahead and jump in, uh, Barbara. We we work well as a team. That's why the four of us host these programs together. So I'll invite uh, Barbara, Barbara, and Anna Marie to just come in here with uh, things. But uh, Deborah, I thought a good place to start actually is with the with your assessment of the healthcare industry in the U.S. today. Um, of course, you're bringing a lot to it, but but why don't we just start with just what what is the, your assessment of you know Western medicine today? Well, you know, I'm going to try to approach this differently from perhaps what people have read in the media. I mean, there's tons of articles and discussions going on on the news everywhere about healthcare in the Western world. To try to put a different lens on it, I would suggest that, again, this is what we found in our research at HeartMath, is that Stress, and particularly emotional stress, is a prime causative issue of health and disease. I mean, disease, really. I mean, if you look at what dis hyphen ease means, it's we're not in ease. Something's out of balance. And stress in a system means something's out of balance with that system. And we're meant to be resilient creatures. All of nature is incredibly resilient which is get stressed or challenged, that's how we grow, and then come back to alignment or balance or ease. When we have been out of balance too long through whatever reasons, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, then this dis-ease starts to create a stress accumulation hormonally, immune system-wise, all sorts of ways in the system, and something starts to break down. Until medicine begins to address that, and I point specifically and put a lens specifically on emotional stress, because that's one thing that most people seem to avoid, run away with, and yet that's the thing that is putting so many millions of people over the edge, you know, all over the world, and these changing energies, uncertain times, especially in the Western world, where we have gotten used to some, you know, living habits and food habits that aren't productive. So I would say that the main missing ingredient is how we address emotional stress, which is directly related to gene expression of what gets expressed in the DNA gene level in terms of what we're susceptible to and epigenetics for disease, all the way to the chronic diseases we're seeing happening now. And nothing's going to really change, I don't perceive, until we take responsibility and help each other with that issue. 
Yes, I've got your book right here. One of the books, the many books that your organization has put out, the HeartMath Solution, in front of me. And what an excellent read it is. You've been with HeartMath since the beginning. So uh, can you just tell us about HeartMath, how it came onto the scene to focus on this problem, did it not? And what uh, what are some of the things that uh, HeartMath suggests we consider here? Sure. Well, we came onto the scene, like uh, Barbara said, founded by Doc Childry, and uh, there are about 30 of us who helped him start the research at HeartMath, and with a hypothesis that the heart was an intelligent system, and we were all long-term meditators at that time, back in 1987, when we first began to plan HeartMath. And the fact that we all knew intuitively in our hearts that the heart was a guiding system and it's where we were connected in oneness and we wanted to see if there was a way to validate that scientifically, physiologically, what's the connections? Because oneness starts internally with the oneness between our heart, our brain, our nervous system, our cells, our spirit. That alignment is what allows us to experience the higher dimensions of oneness and really perceive and feel that connection that we have in the heart. So it gets past the conceptual or the occasional spiritual experience that rivets us into that's who we really are, into more of a step-by-step process to anchor that realization into reality of our experience day-to-day. And so that was our mission, and that wasn't our overt mission. Our overt mission was to help improve people's health and well-being and performance. And that's how we began to research and test the heart math techniques that were developed from the research in the street, as we call it. Our goal was to bring sky to street and really see if these techniques and tools could work for the ordinary person who didn't perhaps believe in anything or was an atheist or had a fundamentalist belief system. It didn't matter what you believed. If you could physiologically use these tools to get your heart and brain and nervous system aligned, then you would connect in the heart with spirit. You would get beyond the separation. You would connect as you use these techniques with the nature's resonant frequency, which is that oneness, that connection with others in the heart. That was our intention and mission, and it still is. And it's been unfolding over the years as we worked, as Barbara said, in all these uh, dense aspects of society helping to leaven the uh, the bread of their perceptions in these organizations to uh, you know to a bigger connection now health is mental emotional physical spiritual so I don't separate it at all because you're not going to heal the physical without that alignment in some way it'll keep popping up somewhere else so again it gets back to the heart at the core love at the core what activates that alignment is truly uh, what we've been researching and love, appreciation, <coughs> compassion, positive emotion, that's really a, an activator. Wow, so many things you shared there. Um, I want to stay on the heart math track, but before we do, because you brought in oneness, and thank you for that, um, so amazing that back in the, you, you, in the 1980s, you, you know, yourself and other uh, doctors, uh, PhDs were building this practice, and, and it was a practice based in oneness. You described how it, you know, we can start by looking at it internally. Um, can you uh, just take us a little deeper into uh, oneness, you know, in terms of maybe your own uh, views on oneness and processes with oneness and just how it helps you to uh, be the professional that you are and have the balance and health and well-being in your own life? Well, it's absolutely essential because if you're not in oneness, you're in separation. If you're in separation, you're in limited perspective. If you're in limited perspective, you end up being in stress pretty quickly. And so it goes, and that's the learning and growing process in this world until we connect with something deeper and realize there's another way. And again, I would suggest that of all the meditative or prayer approaches, it's really what's effective is when people connect with their deeper heart. That's who we really are. It's the doorway to who we really are. And when we connect there, our mind and brain are illuminated and we see new perspectives. And so I use the heart math tools all day long. They become liquid, more like ways of being to when I feel a stress response inside or something triggers or there's that email again from that person that has been annoying. I know to take it back to my heart 
and realign, reboot, reset. I know to prep to be aligned in my heart prior to meetings that could potentially be challenging. I mean, life is life. And, but it's about taking that spiritual experiences and knowing into the moment to moment, into the street, day to day, and learning how to be even more resilient in terms of shifting back. First, it's the awareness of what's going on internally and how it's affecting your perceptions and feelings. And then it's using a simple technique, whether it's heart math or another, to get back into heart, what we call heart coherence, which is that state of alignment of heart, brain, heart, mind, spirit. Oh, I love that. Uh, again, just a treasure trove of things that you shared here, Deborah. Connect with the deeper heart. This is the doorway to who we really are. Um, the thing I loved about this book, uh, The Heart Math Solution, and, and again, there's several other excellent books out uh, from your organization, is it is uh, it's a step. It creates a step by step process for living in oneness. Um, you know, it's it's all about the tangible, and you're not. Uh, you're using secular terms, though spiritual terms are occasionally brought in. But, um, you know, it, it would be hard to get lost in the processes that you lay out for li- living in health and well-being. Well, that's always been our, our <coughs> deepest care. Our service is to use our collective heart intelligence and mind intelligence and any intelligence we could pull in, intuitive intelligence, to what would help people connect more with who they really are? There's so many wonderful processes, so many caretakers on the planet doing different aspects of oneness to lift the wholeness. And ours is specifically to help people learn how to really listen to their heart signals, follow their heart, and get realigned with their heart because we know that what connects them to their higher intelligence, higher self, whatever God, whatever you want to call that. And that's an unfolding process. So when we get caught in these stress baths and we get stuck, we've been trying to help people learn really research-based tools and use the power of your physiology, not only the intuitive heart, but the, in the, the actual power of the physical heartbeat, the heart rhythm pattern. If we can shift that into a more synchronized mode, which our technology helps people do, it powers up our intentions and our ability to get back into alignment. And then you have a positive feedback loop that the physiology is helping the emotions, the intentions are helping the physiology, and you can really accelerate your process, especially for all of us who are can get into overcare or burnout or anxiety. I mean, these energies today are very strong in what we call the shift or the consciousness change on the planet, and people don't know how to quite ride the waves. And if you don't have tools, you can really get caught in the undertow. I mean, we hear all the time people calling in, I'm just over the edge. And people who are trying to serve feeling that way too. So our our passion right now is to really give caregivers and caretakers and people serving and people wanting to give back tools to empower that as well as uh, people who are working in schools and the military. I mean, we just started a new HeartMath Certified Trainer Program to provide these, you know, which you haven't done before, allowing uh, people to get certified to do heart, take these heart map tools and research and slides and give workshops, and coaching and health professionals how to use it in their practices because we just want everybody to who wants to, who feels resonant with this, to be able to take the heart mastery course themselves or teach others or become mentors or, you know, reach the world. Wow, I love your you're actually bringing in our work that those of us that are hosts where you talk about the the shift, you know, the consciousness the changing changes that are going on uh, and then you bring it into the aspect of how to ride the wave. So for those doing that work, um, you know, how can you as you put it, uh, how can we empower the shift? How can we bring tools to people that are doing this work? But as well, you're bringing the tools to hospitals, like you say schools to uh, organizations all over the world. Um, let's go a little deeper into uh, these uh, tools that you provide because you, you share, you know, that you provide breakthroughs on many levels. Um, you've actually been talking about that, some of these breakthroughs and some of these tools, but um, do you want to just kind of take us through sort of the high-level uh, positioning of uh, heart math and the various services and tools that you uh, provide? Sure, I'd love to. Um 
We're in over 100 hospitals, and it, people probably don't all know that nurses have the highest level of highest health care costs of anyone, any occupation, and the highest burnout and the highest level of what we call overcare, strain, uh, pressure, uh, just on and on. And there are health care workers, and they're, they're also giving. They're the people behind a lot of the care and giving why someone will go into nursing. So it's a strong facilitation of care for the caregivers that we do there by providing these tools and what here's an example what organizations and I'm just hospitals are one but we're working in corporations even GlaxoSmithKline the uh, the uh, the drug company has brought in HeartMath as their stress management program and again it's because of it's so research based that the tools the techniques and the technology all of together. There's heart math strategies, uh, programs like heart mapping and uh, being able to look at your emotional landscape and then use a technique to shift out of quickly out of anxiety or anger or frustration or stress and reboot, rebalance your system. And so that's the main thing is now resilience is becoming the popular word and that's exactly what this is. Resilience is not only the ability to bounce back from stress or stressful episodes, but it, you build a reservoir, it's a type of energy that you want to build in your system by practicing being in heart rhythm coherence. And our technology, the M wave or the inner balance technology, shows you when your physiology is there. It actually has a little uh, ear clip that clips to your ear that's a pulse sensor, and then it goes to the software in the app that calculates how much synchronization is in your heart rhythm pattern that reflects the heart brain synchronization. And then guide you through a simple technique called quick coherence or heart lock-in is another technique to be able to really stay in that synchronized state for longer periods and gives you fun games to help train you there so that you can build this reservoir of resilience energy, coherence energy that ends up being protective. It ends up being healing but also uh, enlightening. It raises your consciousness perception and gives you more centeredness, more connection with who you are, but more capability to move through your day, offsetting stress, and then the capability to reboot back to that alignment. And so that's what's appealing to people, and we will use very, very practical healthcare terms for people to be able to just get back in sync. When you're in, reinforce it. When you're out, get back and that appeals to a wide range of organizations. And HeartMath Certified Trainer Program, we allow hospitals and individuals now, that's what we just opened up, to become certified trainers, to be trained the trainers in their organizations or in public workshops, to become coaches or mentors, to be able to share this and support each other in this. We have the HeartMath Interventions Program, which is just for clinicians to be able to see how other doctors are using heart math for everything from pain management to post-traumatic stress disorder, especially in the military, but all, anything trauma for alcohol and drug recovery, and just for plain old chronic disease management or prevention. So that's where we're growing now in our technology, uh, the heart, what I mentioned to you, the heart rhythm coherence feedback is uh, being used now on, we're talking with some major companies interested in licensing our patents and putting it into those, you know, smart watches and wrist, wrist activity monitors and in phones where everything is going and healthcare is moving much more online and we have online training programs and, you know, we're just trying to move with the technology to infuse the technology with heart-based living, heart-based approaches. Awesome. Um, we've got what, about three more minutes before we go into the uh, interactive panel discussion. Barbara Fields is going to bring that in. But So with the few minutes before we go to the next segment in the program, Deborah, um, we've got uh, 14,000 and climbing in, in the registration for this summit. We'll end you know, uh, quite a bit higher even than that. So lots of listeners here. Um, some probably have read your books because they're out there, thank God, and others probably haven't. But uh, for our listeners, are there are there some simple uh, suggestions that you might make? I, I want to mention one of the things that I was sensitized to in reading your material is uh, is the danger and the enormous stress that is a part of daily living. You know, and uh, 
how we need to be aware of that. And then Absolutely. The what I'd like to share with 14,000 or how many listeners directly from my heart is you wouldn't be listening to this program if you weren't a light worker in some way, if you weren't somebody who really was being called to living in oneness or called to learning more about it or actually manifesting in your life. And it is so imperative that we not martyr our, ourselves in the sense of stressed out in the name of doing the good. That is old. It won't work anymore. It will feed back, and you will eventually have health problems. And my appeal from my heart to all your hearts is it's not an, no more excuses. Find a balance in your life. HeartMath and many other organizations, but HeartMath is here to help you do that. If you go to heartmath.com, you can find free resources. You can find the technology. You can find the programs for personal stress management. That's a whole other level than traditional, you know, get stressed out and then in the evening go meditate and try to clear it or try to take a bath or go to aromatherapy. It's imperative for us if we're going to access oneness and live in oneness moment to moment to clear stress as we go during the day. And that's what my books, the ones I wrote with Doc Childry, called Transforming Anxiety, Transforming Anger, Transforming Depression. They're all techniques and tools of how to do that moment to moment so you really change your whole baseline response, reset your response. And that's what caregivers and light workers are really being called on to do today because this Things are only going to speed up more and more and more, and we have to be able to ride those waves and ease and flow and create that flow. And so if this, your heart's being called to what I'm saying, I would just really invite you to uh, go to our website, check it out, and uh, read a book and practice a tool and get back to your deeper heart as often as you can. Okay, often. I love that. Uh, gosh, thank you so much, Deborah. Take care of yourself. Yeah, learn to ride the wave. And what a great uh, suggestion because, uh, gosh, don't we all know so many people that in the so-called lightworking profession who, uh, you know, were almost martyrs. They're just really not taking care of themselves. And as we know, you know, oneness is about really being washed by this energy of the divine and then it's spilling over on others that we're in touch with. And so when we're not taking care of ourselves, we uh, we actually create trouble not only for ourselves but everybody we're in touch with because they can feel that energy of being burned out. Well, so, that's a whole uh, other conversation of how stress is contagious. There's new research that was just published, not ours, showing that and the inner the waves of energy, the energetics from your emotional system, the heart actually radiates out as a transmitter. And we actually receive people's emotional energetics without under the conscious awareness. So we're all affecting each other. It's amazing. It's called empathetic stress. But we need to put out more love and compassion and care because those positive emotions create a different energetic that is a coherent waveform that radiates from the heart. And that's all part of heart mass research that actually is contagious as well. So part of our whole goal with our Global Coherence Initiative is to create a whole coherence momentum, and Barbara and I have talked about that a lot, and that's part of uh, what we've been uh, doing on the energetic research level. Coherence movement, yes. Well, I think uh, all of our work falls right in step with that. That's right. Debra, so we support that 100%. Um, and uh, Barbara Fields, I, can, uh, I think, is coming in next, and if we can go, Barbara, to about 18 minutes or so to allow maybe three or four minutes at the end for our uh, closing items, because we do have a hard stop. Uh, I know you've got uh, the uh, interactive panel discussion here at this point. Sure. Well, what I'd really like to do now is see if we can get some conversation just going um, among the participants um, who are facilitating the call, the five of us here. And the way that I wanted to start it was to ask Barbara Marks Hubbard, who, who of course, while well, listening to Deborah and knowing Deborah's work so well, um, my guess, Barbara, is that you've been having a lot of thoughts pop up in your head as you've been listening to Deborah and might want to jump in here with a few impressions to some of the things that she was bringing up. Well, I would like to tell just one or two stories. Is When I was visiting HeartMath in the early days, every morning <laughs> we would get up and we would do a heart lock-in <laughs> with the music. Yeah. And the breathing together, the whole the whole group, and that heart lock-in, 
has been something that I've tried to do all my life since that time. <laughs> it's really, yeah. you, you started out and it was very interesting to see also the scientific research. One of the things that amazed me, um, Barbara, uh, De- Deborah, was that it, when your scientific researcher showed that the heart can almost send out a predictive signal before something happens. It's sort of like in the uh, secret life of plants, that plants can pick up the danger if somebody's thinking about burning them. And they, they've tested that so that it, it's predictive of what's coming as well as what's already happened. Yes, exactly. The heart, that's the non-local uh, quantum field that the heart is accessing, and that's where the hardcore research has shown is that the physical heart will respond with what's called a heart rate evoked potential response before an event has happened based upon its connection outside of time and space with that event. And that research is really exciting. It's an intuition research and in showing the heart's intuitive intelligence. And, of course, then it signals the brain, and then the brain responds even before the event has occurred. But the heart is first, heart, then brain, then nervous system, and then the physical event happens. So that leads me to, to ask you about the whole idea of a, of a larger field response like we tried to do in Birth 2012 and we're doing here on this global oneness, is to generate a field that's in a way predictive that could help people be in this response before they even have to think about it. Yep. Well, I think that's getting more connected with your heart. I mean, again, you have to reduce the signal to noise ratio within your system to be able to perceive that beyond conceptual isn't that wonderful idea, right? Idealism. But to be able to really know that and then activate that. And again, you stress gets in the way. It'll make the noise like static on a radio. And we know from our research that what you're talking about, Barbara, is actually what's going on. Now, for us to co-create it with more consciousness and access that field from that dimensional level, that level where we really are consciously aware of what's going on on that field. That's where we have to clear the noise from our system, and that's when things can really accelerate powerfully. But in the shift energies, you know, there's a lot of light coming into the planet, and spirit downloads are coming in for a lot of people, which is conditioning the field as well to make it easier and easier for people to uh, to have that intelligence of what they need to do and their next steps and that will help clear the field to make what you're talking about, you know, more apparent. Well, I remember during the Birth 2012 talking with Doc Lou Childers and with you about how many people it would take to be in this heart coherence Mm -hmm. to make it so easy that it would go massive very fast. It could, and, And that has always been extremely important to me because if you think of needing to go one by one by one with all the different people on the planet, that is not such an easy job. But if a critical mass is in this coherence, then the ones uh, will be t- touched by this. And this gives us hope when we're facing these kinds of very rapidly growing climate change and other problems. Yeah. That's that right nervous that this is a time for mass, just like we're doing with Global One this year, mass coherence uh, practices and and mass meditations, but particularly heart. I I mean, I think that's something for us to all uh, relate oneness with heart, because when you're in a heart space, you're feeling at one with the other. Isn't that right? That's right. And you literally are, you know, when we measure it, when you're in that heart coherence, your heart rhythm patterns show up in the brain waves of somebody standing nearby, not even touching you. I know. So. <laughs> well, Deborah, this is Barbara Fields. I have a question for our little panel here. One yeah. of the things that I'd like to ask you in regard to that is the the age of technology and our our sort of tendency to 
um, exchange cyberspace for real time and space yeah. leads me to want to ask a question about what is what's important about our ability to actually be with one another in human settings as human beings in real time and space, meditating together, loving one another, being involved in in conversations that matter to us. But there's this this factor that sometimes really concerns me that we're gathering more and more on telephone calls and on the internet and in you know through our computers and and our extended technologies that extend our outreach to the world, but that there's something being lost that happens, for example, when I get together with my dear friend Barbara Marks Hubbard, who lives next door, mm -hmm. and we, we get into a mind and a heart sink in each other's presence that is of a quality that's far different than what we reach when we're talking to each other on telephones and on the Internet. So I wondered if anybody on the panel, Barbara or Deborah or Anna Marie or Steve, has anything to say about how we can also optimize our real life togetherness at the same time that we're creating this great wave of global coherence? I would say there's a balance. Everything's about balance. The technology is incredible for allowing us to see what's going on internally, like we do with the M wave or the inner balance the Global Coherence Initiative technology, see how the Earth's fields are responding. It's illuminating information that we ne couldn't have access to otherwise. And so is the Internet and the teleclasses and the telesummits. And that's just connecting us all. But it's the quality of our relationships, which you're saying, Barbara Fields. It's our personal nurturing love and connection with friends and family at the deep heart level. That is food for the soul that we then can take and share through these technology internets and get the feedback. So it, to me, it's a figure eight. We go home to our families and our friends and our spiritual groups in person for that deep intimacy, and then we express it outward in our creativity and our connection energetically through the energetic fields. That's how I look at it. Well, I, I think that's a wonderful question, uh, Barbara uh, Fields, because it, it takes a little extra attention to say, I'm going to go next door to Barbara Fields. I mean, that is like the easiest thing in the world. She's right next door. Mm -hmm. And yet sometimes we will go days without doing that mm -hmm. because we get into a pattern of communication that really is not local. And I don't know the effects of this being non-local so much of the day is on the heart and the nervous system. Or is there a way of really generating heart through these non-local means of, like I'm a teacher on, on Internet, and there are thousands of students that I have never met, never seen, never touched. Oh, yes, you're generating tremendous heart. It's like, think of it like a radio wave. Your heart is a radio Mm -hmm. So just like a radio is broadcasting a program through mm -hmm. waves, your emotional and spiritual state is being broadcast, like ours is right now in this discussion, to all the 14,000 people listening. There's a tone, there's energetics, there's, there's frequencies, there's feeling, texture that's being transmitted. And you can hear that feeling, inspiration. I mean, there's a tremendous amount. We're one even in this discussion on certain frequencies, but it's all about balance, and it, we know what our balance is by listening to our heart, and that's why I know for myself, if I spend all day on emails and telesummits, which even though it's a very heart-based, this one, or with technology, I will get out of balance. My heart will start signaling, Debbie, you need to go spend some time in your rose garden, because mm -hmm. there's other textures that my body needs for nourishment, my system, my spirit, my soul needs. You need to spend some time with Howard, my husband, for another level of nourishment, texture. Textures are food, and so you need to renew. And so listening to the heart, because we can get, as caregivers, so focused on our mission and get, head, get out of balance, which is too much head, and not go back to the well. And so it's really, really important to keep refining our heart listening, and then we have to step into it. That's the next thing. It's listening to well, what your heart Well, let me jump is. in here for a moment and ask, and ask Steve, 
with this, since we have a hard stop today right at the top of the hour, wouldn't this be the right time to invite some questions and comments from our listeners so that we can expand the field of our little panel here into all the people who have been standing by and listening throughout the call? You know, the um, the comments that are all coming in are, are just comments of um, somebody says uh, that love, just keep on loving, you know, is somebody in the Martin in um, uh, Michigan says. is So a comment just as an underscore comment. And then another comment, uh, I guess it's a question. Um, she says, I wonder if after some of the spiritual activism events that we do, we did a Save the Water call recently, you know, the Fukushima reactor thing mm -hmm. that prompted a, a spiritual activism call on Save the Water. We did uh, the Ho'oponopono, you know, meditation together. And, and uh, this person says, gosh, wouldn't it be incredible if there were some way to measure, you know, the uh, heart coherence of the group? and um, any healing, you know, uh, that, that was taking place where we have people all over the earth that are on a large call, you know, that are doing healing work together. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting one. Uh, maybe maybe we can c consider that a question. And yeah. Have we tried to measure, you know, healing practices where groups come together all over the world? Well, put it this way. Um, we have a group coherence uh, methodology and patent that was just issued, and we're trying. Are we're working with several companies, including a game company, but we will be this year at some point producing that into our Inner Balance app and our Heart Cloud, which we have already. It's an iPhone. It's an iOS app for iPhone or iPad, and we hope to be producing it on Samsung too. But at this point, we're just launching it there in the heart cloud where you can see the individual coherence, but we're going to be linking people in group coherence so that we'll be able to see our collective coherence. Individual people can opt in and send their actual score, their, their level of coherence number that is being measured in real time into the cloud system that we have. And we'll be able to then send back, here's the collective heart coherence level and you know, whatever the numerical value is, let's say it's 50. And then we can invite everyone to do the heart lock-in, provide the technique, and have music audio with it or do your own music or image or whatever and see if we can raise that score in real time and then raise the baseline of the collective. That's part of what we're planning with the Global Coherence Initiative. So all that we hope to have sometime this year. We're actually still looking for funding to be able to, you know, to uh, complete that, but it's it's almost done. Oh, I uh, love that. Um, that well, that's just great. I, I hope that you'll keep in touch with us about that because if um, I, I could offer our October event as a real-time focus group if you wanted to test in, in a real-time gathering what um, people using your app um, could report based on being together through a week-long experience and then using the app in order to report their scores and mm -hmm. determining the group's coherence. I think that would be really interesting. be very interesting. Well, let's talk about that more. Hopefully we'll have it ready by then. Um, Great. You know, I've actually thought about doing, oh, what do you call them, Indiegogo or those crowdsourcing things to raise the rest of the funds. It's just a matter of getting another engineer because we're, we're spread so thin in another in a number of areas, so that I'd love to do that. Understand. I'll bring in one other quick thing um, that's kind of related, and then uh, Barbara back to you. And then uh, before the close, where we'll share a few things. Somebody uh, said in Washington D.C. there was a week-long round-the-clock meditation, and that uh, the crime rate went down. So, you know, another. I'm not sure how. I guess you can you can measure you know crime going down. So. Well, you, you that that's that's very um, that's social measurements, and I know that uh, there's a whole group that did that years ago, the TM group. I don't know if this is what she's referring to, but um, it's it's very. Uh, I'm sure that'll work. It's just that we're trying to do it affecting the Earth's fields here, and we don't know. We've done stuff like that too. I just as scientists. You've got to be so careful of whether that really was accurate because then you get feedback from the traditional scientific community and you end up being marginalized. And we at HeartMath, one of our goals, and we've been very careful of this, is to involve the whole peer-reviewed scientific community in our process. So it's 
really the physiology shifts. And then, of course, if we can see changes in the Earth's field through the Global Coherence Monitoring System, uh, that's all being peer-reviewed and peer-monitored right now. What I would suggest people who want to be part of this global coherence or group coherence, you know, measurements is if you can, get the M-Wave or the Inner Balance and app and start, go to heartmath.com and you'll be able to see what that is, and start increasing your personal coherence baseline. Because like Barbara was saying, there is a critical mass. It's not that many people that once we're resonating in a certain individual physiological heart coherence baseline, as we come together in that group coherence, we're going to be able to really make a huge uh, facilitated shift in the planetary fields. That's the hypothesis, and that's what we want to measure. But it starts with the individual first getting their own alignment, and it's so easy to fool ourselves. I use my m wave or inner balance every day to make sure at least I start my meditation in the real heart coherent state, and then I'll do my intentions and other things, you know, what, you know, from there. So that's really step one is our individual heart coherence level and, and really checking that out and increasing it. You know, I just, this is Barbara Hubbard. It's <clears throat> really quite fascinating to me as the human race is being told that we have this very rapidly accelerating danger in climate change and other such activities, and at the same time, we have a very rapidly accelerating capacity to become coherent. Exactly. Both on the personal level and then on the fact of there being, uh, uh, I was told, 7 billion cell phones, meaning the whole human race approximately is being connected. So maybe it's true like a birth phenomenon. As the danger increases where it can really destroy the system, so, too, is the birthing process happening this fast, and I like the idea that in our lifetime, because of the speed-up of, of the problems, in our lifetime, the speed-up of the coherence is also happening, and we are the lucky ones to be able to feel it. Absolutely, and as we accelerate our coherence baseline, we actually create a draw to bring in new frequencies. It creates a magnetic field that can bring in new solutions to some of our problems. Well, yes, because yes. so many of the problems are caused by separation. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. Exactly. This is Anna Marie. This is Anna Marie, everyone. I had so many questions to ask, and I'm so excited listening to you, Deborah. It's, it's really fantastic and gives me lots of hope. So um, this hour has been too short, so I know that we have to go over to closing, but I just wanted to say that lots of questions that I could have asked, but it has been wonderful listening to you, and I'm so inspired. Well, thank you so much. You know, we can connect offline, too. One of the next areas we have designed that we want to put a monitoring system in for the Earth field, we have one in Saudi Arabia, we just installed one in New Zealand, is South Africa because of where it's located. So if you have any ideas, we can talk offline. Fantastic. Yes, you have been uh, fabulous. Let me go ahead and start into the uh, wrap-up process because, as I shared at the beginning, our hours was going to go way too fast, and we're down to four minutes. Uh, I want to share we've been conspiring, actually, Deborah. I better, you know, transparency is part of oneness, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, all of us uh, on the hosts on this call are involved with Global Oneness Day, which is our big um, activism day. It's United Nations Day, October 24, and there's a health and well-being panel that uh, – Gene Houston and uh, Lynn McTaggart are on, and we're gonna we're gonna come knock on your door uh, because you would just be fantastic for that panel. And, okay. Uh, just as Anna Marie said, you uh, you've really, <laughs> I think you've created more questions here uh, just mm -hmm. through all of your answers. Uh, it's just it's just incredible the work that you're doing. Um, now I want to just say uh, thank you, um, or, or actually before I say thank yous, Barbara Fields, anything uh, quick that you want to come in with? No, I just think it's such an important field to keep exploring, and I especially want to say that my hat's off to you, Deborah, for keeping in mind the importance of um, this vigilance in um, scientific peer review, because it's true that when we've gotten this far in our research, we don't want to be dismissed out of hand by the traditional scientific community, because our, our research methods are not rigorous enough. So. I really applaud you for keeping that piece alive as well. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And this is going to cut off now in about 20 seconds. So a uh, huge thank you, Deborah, to you, Deborah Rosman with HeartMath. Wow, thank you so much for being here. My co-host, Barbara Fields, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Anna Marie Petiers, just thank you so much. What an incredible hour it's been. And to all of you, the listeners who have been with us, uh, we are grateful. Thank you. If you'd like to receive all of our new podcast episodes, please click on the subscribe button. To find out more about Humanities Team transformational education programs and about how you can help support our mission, please visit us online at humanitiesteam.org, where you can also sign up for our email list so we can let you know about our free online events and other news about what we're up to each week. And again, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review. Thank you.